Once you said to me, and I never forgot that, which was one of the things that art can still do is to slow down time. Do you still believe that? Almost oh, definitely. In Buddhism, there's a very wonderful idea, or a couple of ideas. One of them is that all intention misses the mark. So in that sense, art happens. Art happens. You don't get up in the morning and say, I'm going to make something beautiful today, or I'm going to make something spiritual today. You can't. I mean, we don't know what it is. But what we can do is recognize that beauty is here. Here, right now. There it is. That, isn't that mark on the floor beautiful? Um, and I think that is our job as artists, to recognize that beauty is, is imminent and possible and here. So in that process of recognizing that something, that a condition, if you like, already exists, that you can't make it happen, there is something that I feel is, is equally tender. And that is that when one recognizes that moment, um, something happens to time. That, that is to say, it takes you out of yourself. The other Buddhist idea is that, that we must live in the now, whatever that means. What does it mean to live in the now? As one looks into it deeper, one of the things that I think it means is that you give yourself away. So when you're involved in something, when I'm really drawing and really doing my thing, or when I'm really cooking and I'm just involved in it, I have given myself away. And time has gone. For those minutes, seconds, whatever it is, time has gone. Now, I believe art can do that. Art is deeply intimate. It calls on engagement. And in that engagement, there is a kind of reverie, a kind of dreaming, a kind of space of dreaming. Those moments, even if they're only you know, fractions of a second, for those moments, time does not exist. difícil traducir en palabras qué es lo que se siente entre la obra de Capur y es difícil precisamente porque si hubiera palabras para describir eso probablemente las obras no serían tan interesantes, ¿no? Si yo pudiera contarles de qué se trata Destierro o Imagino Azul o la obra Ansiedad que es la tercera instalación que tenemos en el parque que tiene que ver también con, con el sonido y con la sensación del sonido en el cuerpo si yo pudiera explicar esto y la explicación cerrara, digamos, no, no, no harían falta las piezas, no haría falta crearlas y hacerlas existir en el mundo para que la gente las pueda, las pueda abordar. Y por eso vale la pena que la gente las venga a ver, porque no las van a poder transmitir en palabras, ni siquiera con una imagen fotográfica, ni fílmica, ni con un texto, por más maravilloso que sea un ensayo en un, en un catálogo, en un libro, la presencia física de la, de, de, del espectador, del visitante, eh, ante la obra de Kapoor es fundamental. No hay experiencia estética sin eso.
my brother and I, we grew up in India, and my brother and I were sent off to Israel, um, and I was not well. My aunt, my aunt who lived in Israel, suggested that the only way that I could get better was if my mother brought some earth from India, some special earth, and put it under my bed. So the earth was brought from India and it was put under my bed. This of course is a shamanistic um, kind of process of renewal. It's not detached in a way from the work that I've just made um, here in Buenos Aires. So the, the earth was under my bed and of course I was 16 years old and I thought, what the hell is this? You know, why do I have to go through this process? It's taken me many years to understand that it's deeply powerful. The space under the bed is dark and in it is this land. And what is this earth? It's a ritual material. And I'm going to say that there are two ritual materials. One is earth and the other one is blood. Blood. Who owns blood? Blood is owned by women, not by men. Blood, of course, is menstrual. It comes without, without will. But it is an act, it is a process that makes solidarity. And one might say that those are the first acts of joining up, of uh, communal identification. It is also with this an idea that red ochre, red, red of the earth, was used to paint the body and it was the first act of culture. So, first act of culture one might describe as a feminine act and I believe in that very, very strongly. It comes out in my work over and over again. You know, I'm very taken by this idea of solidarity. Men, of course, have no means of blood. And the only ways we have to blood is through hunting um, and through acts of initiation. And I think the assumption of blood in male society is another aspect of this ritual act. So I push it pretty hard. I know I'm pushing a point of view, but I believe it's absolutely central to what we do. Um, as artists, we are not makers of more or less beautiful things. Who cares? You know, bah, more or less. You know, Louis Vuitton does it better. We are do something else. It's not about more or less beautiful things. I do feel that we need to remember this thing, which I call ritual. The mechanical machine, you know, in this cycle of blood and red and ritual, the ritual of dance, women, and so on, blue comes much later. Blue is a cultural invention. What is it? Blue is God in the sky. God used to be in the earth with the women, and now it's in the bloody sky, you know. So I'm suspicious of blue, even though I've used it a lot. I wonder about blue. I wonder whether blue is yet another kind of cultural imposition of God up there. Well, God's not up there. Maybe God's down there. And God is feminine, not masculine. I mean, I'm going to dare it because I think it's vital in, in, our, in our confused society which sees half our population as less good than the other half of the population. Forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> the 
when you see this presentation and when you think of works like uh, the Olympic Tower, Cloud Gate, all these super high scale uh, works, Marcius, you think of an artist who is uh, closer to an architect, planning things in a very indirect way. But by knowing you in person, I have seen so much of how much you put your body, your hands in your work. You know, I have seen you fight against the wax. I have seen you yesterday fighting against the machine. And I've seen you, you know, fighting against the paintings and putting your action into this. What is the importance of the hand of the artist? Yeah, uh, well, I think... Um, hmm, complicated. I have a weird relationship to the hand. Because, in a way, of course, I've talked of no hand. In the past, I have uh, often spoken to say that the hand of the artist is overrated. With all respect to architects, I definitely am not an architect. I think rationality has its limits. And the whole point of being an artist, taking on this kind of crazy role of the artist is to go beyond the rational, go beyond what I think I know, what is, what is rationally possible. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. You know, how do we go beyond what we know? Uh, really, therefore, I come back to the idea of practice. This repetition, going to the studio, continuing, repeating a work, repeating another work, making another one and another one. Out of that, there are little moments in which something occurs um, that is, that is um, somewhere else. It is the only way, I believe. Lo material es importante a la obra de Capur. La escala es importante también, aunque él trabaja mucho el concepto del vacío. Paradójicamente, a veces hace grandes construcciones también, monumentales construcciones justamente para, para lograr hablar artísticamente del vacío. En este caso, aquí en el Parque de la Memoria, en, en la sala y en el parque en sí, tenemos tres instalaciones de Capur. Una en particular, que es de estierro, Es eh, una obra inédita, una obra que él ideó especialmente para el Parque de la Memoria. Mejor dicho, es una idea, un boceto de obra que él tenía. A los artistas les sucede esto, tienen ideas, bocetos, que los tienen como en carpeta o en archivo para trabajarlos en algún momento cuando llegue la oportunidad. Y la oportunidad fue aquí, fue el, la invitación que le hicimos desde el Parque de la Memoria a través de su curador, el curador de la muestra, Marcelo Dantas. This is not this. Tenemos esta obra que Anilla había realizado solamente una vez previamente en la Galería Lison en Londres y a Marcelo Dantas y al propio Anish les pareció muy pertinente reeditarla aquí en el Parque de la Memoria. Es una instalación sonora que trabaja a partir de un sonido subsónico que es bastante particular dentro del, del, del repertorio, digamos, del cuerpo de obra de, de Capur, porque es una obra en donde el público se ve 
eh, dentro de un espacio, en penumbra. Hay un sonido que tampoco es audible, el sonido existe pero vos no lo puedes escuchar. Y el sonido te aborda a vos como espectador directamente en el cuerpo. En el contexto del Parque de la Memoria puede encontrar ecos de significación muy particulares. Nosotros eh, estamos frente al Río de la Plata, donde fueron arrojados muchos de los cuerpos de los desaparecidos, pero también puede, y, o, o simultáneamente, puede también encontrar eh, resonancias y ecos que tengan que ver con una cuestión existencial, digamos, ¿no? No, no necesariamente... Eh, digamos, relacionados con un hecho político en particular. Y eso sucede con toda la muestra de Kapoor. One of the things about um, inner language is that it is consistent, surprisingly, it's consistent. So um, it's almost impossible to not return to the same process, same questions again and again and again. Rare, I think, are those who have more than one um, set of psychic inner realities. That's one thing. As a citizen, as you say, I'm hugely motivated to, to have a voice, to use a voice. I discovered a few years ago that I have a voice. Um, and that we all have voices, and if we don't use them, who the hell is going to use them? The terrible things that happened in this country, that happened, um, that happen across the world, that happen in the country where I was born, they happen in our name, and we cannot keep silent. So, I feel it is absolutely essential that we speak well or badly, but that we speak. So that's, that's one thing. But art can't be mixed up with that, and that is one of the problems. Um, there are artists who make um, objects, things, propositions that are straightforwardly political. I think what that does on the whole, and I don't, you, know, you can only generalize in this, but on the whole, I believe that that limits the work, that what it does is say that it's, it's stuck to whatever the quotidian political questions of a certain time, and that when that time passes, the art loses its, its, its emotive power. So I think we have to be very careful and clear that the poetic object has a different mission. It can affiliate itself with quotidian politics, but it has a different mission and we have to be, as artists, very, our eyes set on that mission. Um, we, live, we live in times where most objects that we come across, in fact all objects that we come across, nearly all objects that we come across, are perfectly describable. You know, we, we know what they are, we know what their meaning is, we know how they live in our context, etc., etc. But sometimes we come across things that we say, what is that? And I, I like those questions. What is that? Is it art? Is it meaningful? Why do I care? Etc., etc. I think those are very important questions. Mysterious objects, mysterious things are few and far between. And If one can leave just one or two behind, that seems to me to be a life worth lived.